Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pat Bradley with Minnesota Normal, and we'll get this breakout session started. Uh, this session is with Dr. Dave Bierman, and he's been in the medical cannabis business since 2000. Has a wealth of experience. Uh, did, did some interesting work for for a Reagan commission back in California many moons ago, and is going to share his knowledge and experience on the subject. Welcome, Dr. David Bierman. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know everybody's kind of got their own spot, but uh, why don't you all kind of move in here and uh, make some new friends, uh, you, know, you would. Uh, just feels more comfortable to talk to a bunch of people rather than to some scattered empty chairs. But, <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna just uh, jump right into it uh, here. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, the history of things. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little uh, uh, history. I'm gonna talk about the current situation in uh, medicinal cannabis and what the future holds. And I will try to go rapidly enough so that there's an opportunity for questions. Uh, I've already had a number of uh, informal discussions with several of you uh, that have been very productive and you've asked some really good questions. So I do have 14 years uh, history doing medicinal cannabis. I've written a couple of books, uh, hold up book. Uh, the, some of you, I guess, have bought it. I'll be available after the talk to sign it. Uh, if uh, later on in the day uh, you get it, I'll be available after my next uh, presentation to, uh, uh, to sign it. And the idea in uh, the book, I place uh, cannabis laws in the context of the laws generally and policies generally towards all drugs. And basically the point is, is that the reason we have these laws has little or nothing to do with science and everything to do with greed and discrimination. In the first book, uh, the best line that I had in there is we wouldn't have the drug laws today if it weren't for the Irish. Uh, and the reason I mention that is uh, in uh, today's world, the laws are used to discriminate in the United States against Hispanics and uh, uh, African Americans. Uh, but drug laws have been used throughout the ages uh, to marginalize them. And we all know who they are. They are people who aren't us. And most of us in this room know that at one time or another, maybe still now, we are them. Uh, and quite frankly, we should be us. But anyway, you can read the book uh, and uh, get more of an idea on that. I helped start the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. I'm on the board of the Americans for Safe Access. Uh, and so on. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history. I'm going to describe the state of modern medicinal cannabis uh, and then talk about policy issues, which is one of the things that you're really interested in, let you know about uh, a little bit about the status of current research, and I'm going to uh, give you some ideas about what I think uh, legitimate uh, clinical practice in medicine should be, and I was uh, impressed with uh, Keith when he said, uh, you know, don't just go into the doctor and expect to uh, get a recommendation. Unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of those doctors in California, uh, and the media loves to focus on them rather than those of us that are practicing real medicine. And I'm especially thinking of the guy on Venice Beach who has a young lady in a bikini uh, with a sign saying $49.95 or whatever his price is. And basically, you see him for five minutes and uh, you know, give him the money, he pats you on the ass, and sends you out with a recommendation. Which, on the one hand, is fine uh, if you already know a lot about cannabis, if you don't need to ask about rods of administration and dosage, and if you don't need anybody to show up and testify for you in court. Uh, but if you, know, you ever get arrested, um, oftentimes these places like Medicam or other chains 
uh, the doctor will just be working for them for three or four months and good luck in finding them uh, you know a year later when you need somebody to come into court and talk about uh, your particular situation. So we're going to talk about the history of medicinal cannabis and history is something I really love uh, but if you're interested in that uh, buy the book because uh, uh, we're really here to uh, talk about laws and uh, give you some ideas on the medicinal use of uh, cannabis and why that's an important issue, why uh, cannabis is such a, an amazing uh, medicinal product. We know that it's legal in many states uh, and we know that hundreds of thousands of people are legally using cannabis. So. As I said, history is my uh, forte. I won't uh, go into it in extensive uh, uh, detail, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the history. The Emperor Shan Nen, who may or may not have been uh, mythical, uh, or the second emperor of China, uh, by Chinese oral tradition, is said to have written the Ping Chao Ching, which is the oldest Materia Medica known to man uh, in 2637 BC. It included ma, uh, or huma, uh, which is marijuana, uh, and uh, one of the things that was used to be useful for was analgesia. And the attributes of cannabis were well known in the ancient world, not just China, and was used as an analgesic, a childbirth anesthetic for treating migraines, indigestion, insomnia, and many other conditions. Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy uh, was a Irish physi a physician trained in Great Britain who spent uh, much of his career in India. He actually was knighted for helping to put the telegraph across India and while in India he became exposed to the medicinal use of cannabis. He did research with animals and then used it with people and came back to uh, England in 1839 and told people about uh, what he had seen and what he had done and it soon gone on. It was in the United States Pharmacopeia. Uh, this is a private uh, compendium of commonly used medications from 1854 through 1941. Um, Queen Victoria received uh, cannabis for her menstrual cramps, probably in the form of a tincture. Uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds was a very prominent physician. He was the court physician. Uh, he wrote, I think it was the first edition of Lancet in 1894. Lancet is arguably the most prestigious medical journal in the world. Uh, you know, some people might say the New England Journal, but it's between the two of them for being the, the top two about the use of cannabis. Uh, Sir William Osler, and I've got the date wrong, it was 1892. Uh, that he came out with uh, his first uh, textbook of internal medicine. Osler is considered to be the father of modern medicine and he, his book had two more editions and in all three editions he said that cannabis was the best treatment for migraine headaches. It was found in patent medicine, all your large pharmaceutical companies such as Lilly, Squibb, Merck, uh, uh, it had different kinds of cannabis products, uh, whole leaf, powdered, uh, uh, tincture, and at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, cannabis was the third or fourth most common uh, ingredient uh, in prescriptions or over-the-counter drugs after opium and uh, alcohol. It was uh, eventually uh, replaced as number three by aspirin and fell to number four. Now, I have to digress a little bit into hemp because the reason, in my opinion, that cannabis is illegal has nothing to do with marijuana and everything to do with hemp. And since the drug bill, uh, the farm bill, excuse me, uh, that was signed in law this January legalized hemp, I declared the drug war over. Uh, again, uh, for those of you that don't see my tongue in cheek, that is a tongue in cheek remark. So what's so important about hemp and uh, why, what's the relationship to why we're here today? Uh, hemp was the most profitable agricultural product in the world for 1,000 years until the 1880s. Uh, and because of the invention of the cotton gin in 1820 and the demise of um, uh, sailing vessels in place of steam uh, vessels, uh, the demand for uh, hemp uh, dropped. Also, 
uh, hemp was uh, expensive to harvest and uh, prepare for industrial uses. Uh, George Schlichten invested $400,000, uh, which was a lot of money uh, back at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, if we take a look at how much the 1% have, uh, I guess that's just chump change now. But anyway, um, in 20 years, and developed a decorticator uh, that cut the labor in half and thereby made hemp uh, competitive with not only uh, wood pulp for making paper, uh, but also with products that were made out of oil. Okay, so threat to the cotton industry, wood pulp industry, petrochemical industry. And I mentioned Sir William Osler. Uh, he's of such stature, I thought I'd throw his picture up here. Now, in the 1920s, there was a lot of use of cannabis, uh, and uh, it was found in cigarettes that were marketed for treatment of asthma. And cannabis is both a bronchodilator uh, and an anti-inflammatory, uh, the same as Advair. So there's no reason why it wouldn't be useful for asthma, and it is, and I have a number of uh, patients who use it for that. In the 1920s, American doctors wrote about three million prescriptions a year uh, that contained uh, cannabis. At that time, doctors would actually put different ingredients down uh, as opposed to today where we write a prescription for uh, a manufactured pharmaceutical that contains usually one ingredient. And I mentioned the, about the major pharmaceutical companies. Now, what happened was is that herbal medicine, plant-based medicine uh, fell out of favor uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And I believe this was due to the cult of modernism because it's arguable that there was a greater change in the last half of the 19th century and the first third of the 20th century in terms of technology than there was in the last half of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century. And we know the amount of technological change that we've had today. And one of the things that was seen as modern were manufactured pharmaceuticals. And manufactured pharmaceuticals were, the argument was as well, these, these aren't plants, these are better than plants. So we can understand them better. There's only one compound in there. Plants are complicated. They have lots of compounds in there. Uh, and that helped them to be less popular amongst physicians, that is plant-based medicines. Uh, the other thing is that I had the Flexner Report down there, and the Flexner Report was funded by the Carnegie Foundation uh, in the 19, came out in 1910, and it tended to marginalize those branches of medicine that uh, were more knowledgeable and placed more uh, credibility on herbal medicines, the osteopaths, the homeopaths, the naturopaths, and it elevated the allopaths, MDs, when I, with my uh, branch of, of medicine. And we are only in the last 15 years or so catching up to uh, physicians in these other branches of medicine that uh, have taken a more holistic uh, approach. So you begin to have uh, quote, modern doctors uh, writing fewer prescriptions containing a variety of compounds and more often writing for the manufactured pharmaceuticals. Now, uh, you also uh, had the progressives who uh, saw a lot of problems in this country and they reformed the meatpacking industry and uh, uh, it was one of the progressives who were important in getting the women to vote and that sort of thing. They also uh, attacked the patent medicine uh, industry. And some patent medicines uh, you know, had things that were actually harmful. Uh, most patent medicines contained at least one ingredient that was useful. It could be alcohol, could be cocaine, could be uh, opium, could be marijuana. Uh, so people were becoming uh, more uh, concerned uh, about uh, what they were uh, consuming and more concerned about plant-based medicine or herbal medicine. Now, the most effective drug law ever passed was the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, which was in part uh, motivated by uh, the muckrakers and the progressives. And what that drug law did was it relied on uh, humans' intelligence. Uh, 
You don't see that happening very often with our laws today. Uh, and what it required was that you put the ingredients that were in the patent medicine on the bottle. And if you get old bottles of patent medicines that contain cannabis, it will say approved by the FDA. So how did cannabis go from being the third most commonly used uh, drug in the country uh, to being outlawed? So you, know, you begin to have the manufactured pharmaceuticals, you have the progressives. Um, one of the things that amazed me is that uh, California uh, is, was the first state to outlaw marijuana, uh, although usually Utah is given, quote, the credit for that. Uh, some of you may know that Mitt Romney's grandfather was one of the Mormons that went to Mexico uh, to uh, be able to continue practicing polygamy, uh, and they were going to convert the Mexicans into Mormonism. Uh, excuse me, that lasted for about 10 years and then they came running back to Utah uh, and they brought with them uh, the use of cannabis and that didn't last very long. The uh, Mormon Synod uh, said that was a bad idea and since they controlled the state legislature in 1913, uh, Utah outlawed um, uh, marijuana. Uh, in California in 1910, uh, marijuana was inserted in the California Poisons Act so that's why sometimes it escapes uh, uh, attention as California having the uh, honor, quote unquote, of being the first state to make a cannabis, or make marijuana illegal. Now, <laughs> marijuana was illegal, but cannabis wasn't. Uh, you, you figure that out. Okay, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about Harry Anslinger and Lamont DuPont um, and the propaganda on the word uh, marijuana. Uh, but Lamont DuPont does not get enough credit for the insane uh, drug laws that we uh, have. So I told you about the prescriptions. In 1937, when the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, there were 28 over-the-counter medications you'd go in any drugstore in the United States that contained cannabis. Um, and uh, so manufactured pharmaceuticals were seen as uh, modern. So that was one reason why they were taking precedence over cannabis. But cannabis was not standardized. And that, that's a criticism you hear to this day. And of course, the difficulty with standardization is because it's illegal. You find lots of standardized products now in Canada and California. That criticism really no longer uh, uh, stands. And the other criticism is, well, there's lots of different stuff in there, uh, lots of different chemicals in there. Well, it's true. Plants are uh, complex. I mean, coffee has 880 different molecules. Uh, tomato has 380, and marijuana has 483. And actually, it turns out that that's a good thing. Uh, that's probably one of the reasons why there are far fewer side effects uh, with cannabis uh, than with uh, uh, the manufactured pharmaceuticals that might be used uh, instead of cannabis to treat some of the same things. And that's what prompted uh, uh, the DEA's chief administrative law judge, Francis Young, to say in 1988, after a two-year rescheduling hearing, uh, that hearing was put forth by normal. Uh, they, they asked for the hearing in 1972, uh, although I have to check with Keith to make sure I got my date right. It took 14 years before it actually made its way to the court and then they had two years off and on of hearing, and what Judge Young said was that cannabis was one of the safest therapeutic agents known to man. Okay, well here's the fun stuff. Now, I didn't notice this, uh, but uh, if you look, this man is uh, injecting, injecting marijuana into this lady's arm. Uh, my medical advice is don't do that. Uh, but what was pointed out to me is that this fella is an African American. So there was some subtle racism that was going on here. Uh, and uh, you know, of course nowadays uh, we have a lot of not so subtle racism. Uh, reefer madness uh, is just uh, pure hype. Uh, and it was put out there in order to uh, change the laws regarding cannabis. And here's some more thing, beware the friendly ch stranger. And you had a lot of Pulp Fiction uh, thing. Uh, 
these covers suggest that uh, you know if you use cannabis, uh, boy, you're going to become a wanton uh, woman. Uh, I don't know if you become a wanton man, but you do become a wanton woman. Okay, so the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937 was based on the Machine Gun Tax Act, and it was started in 1935 uh, by Lamont DuPont. Now, I have to say that there is no smoking gun. There, this is all by inference, uh, but it strongly uh, the the uh, uh, evidence, uh, circumstantial evidence, strongly suggests that it was Lamont Dupont. And the near smoking gun does come from Dr. Woodward. Now, Dr. Woodward has an amazing pedigree. He was the commissioner of health for Washington, D.C. for 20 years and then for Boston. He was past president of the American Public Health Association. He was an attorney and a doctor. And he was the chief legal counsel of the AMA from 1924 until sometime past 1937. Plus, he'd been involved in drafting all the major federal uh, drug laws, uh, starting with the uh, Pure Food and Drug Act. And um, he said that the, uh, he'd been going to the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs at least 10 times in the two years in which uh, the Marijuana Tax Act had been secretly developed, and uh, that nobody had asked him, nobody had mentioned it, nobody had officially asked the AMA. So this is why I know that the Marijuana Tax Act had nothing, nothing to do with drugs nothing to do with uh, human behavior. Um, and why it strongly suggested that it had to do with the oil companies. And this was really driven home to me in watching uh, uh, Rachel Maddow's documentary on how we got into the war in Iraq. Uh, and it began with the efforts to um, uh, get George Bush the Republican nomination. The oil interests were working on that. So my guess is the oil interests had even more power in the 1930s. The Marijuana Tax Act was introduced by a guy named uh, Robert Doherty, uh, who uh, was uh, from uh, North Carolina, uh, had 5,000 acres of land, was a racist, and uh, uh, carried water for the DuPont Corporation. So it's strongly suggested that DuPont had his, his hand in here. Uh, and once the Machine Gun Tax Act was found constitutional. Uh, then they started the hearings. And the hearing was held only before, before the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and that way, they only had to have committee hearings before one congressional committee. And uh, there were a number of people besides the AMA who testified against it, including, I believe it was a paint company from Winona. Uh, and uh, you also had uh, the birdseed manufacturers. They testified against it. Uh, recognized that uh, at that time, probably the two biggest producers of hemp were Wisconsin and Minnesota. It might be again. So what Woodward said was is that the AMA knew of no harm for the medicinal use of cannabis. Now recognize that cannabis had been in the USP since 1854. I mean, if you read Dr. Woodward's testimony, it would stand up just about 100% today. And I really suggest that you, you take a look at it. I think you'd be blown away by what uh, he had to say. And since Woodward had been in Washington, D.C. for years, he pointed out that he had contacted the Bureau of Prisons, the Children's Bureau, the United States Public Health Service, and he rattled off about three or four other agencies. And he says not one of them had one iota of data to back up the outrageous claims that Mr. Anslinger is making. And all that Mr. Anslinger has is a fistful of newspaper clippings. And we know that most of those articles were actually written by Anslinger, so of course he agreed with them. And here's what, uh, what Woodward said. He was also critical of the word marijuana, which we don't really know what the origin of that word is. My best guess is it's Portuguese, and David Abel in Marijuana of the First 12,000 Years makes the argument for why it's probably Portuguese. And that makes some sense, since it's most likely that marijuana was first introduced uh, into uh, the New World for smoking purposes in the 16th century in Brazil, and that uh, slaves from Africa planted it between uh, sugarcane crop and then uh, after the uh, sugarcane harvest, uh, smoked marijuana in order to try to uh, relax, I guess. So. 
what Woodward said was, we don't know why you're calling this marijuana. It's cannabis. Everybody knows that it's cannabis. And of course, the American public knew what cannabis was. They knew what hemp was. And one has to think that marijuana was specifically chosen uh, so people wouldn't know what they were talking about. So you had this demonization campaign that we're still uh, uh, dealing with. Uh, we talked about Woodward's uh, testimony. And you know my conclusion, and I think yours too, is that the Marijuana Tax Act was motivated by uh, commerce and by racism. Uh, Anslinger, in my opinion, uh, gets way too much credit for the Marijuana Tax Act. He did not have enough juice. He was an opportunist. Uh, he was looking for an excuse to expand his bureaucracy. And I would say that Anslinger was the greatest bureaucrat of all time because he created a problem where none existed, uh, which allowed him to uh, increase the size of his staff and increase his uh, uh, power. Um, in 1938, uh, Popular Mechanics ran an article called Hemp the Billion Dollar Crop. And remember, this is at a time when a billion dollars was a lot of money. Uh, and so it was something that the uh, commercial interests, the economic interests, the top 1% had some reason to uh, fear. In um, 1938, the Federal Food, Drug and Cosme Food, Cosmetic and Drug Act was passed after 100 people died from a sulfur product that uh, Massengill made that just happened to have something in it that was similar to antifreeze. Most of the 100 people that died were infants. And so this is what gave the Food and Drug Administration its ability to say, uh, yes, this drug is safe, or no, it's not. But all pre-1938 medications were grandfathered in. And I, I, this is a factoid I need to find out, is why cannabis has to go through the FDA approval process now since it was grandfathered in. And I'm guessing it's because it dropped out of the United States Pharmacopeia in 1942. But if anybody in the audience wants to come up afterwards and educate me on that, I would appreciate it. So even after it dropped out of the United States Pharmacopeia, uh, Morris Fishbein, who was the editor of uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, for many, many years and was seen as the really voice and face of the AMA, said that cannabis was the most useful treatment for migraines. Uh, Fishbein uh, had actually been um, on the Flexner's uh, staff. And I didn't realize Sir Fishbein's uh, history, but there used to be a, a magazine, a sort of a medical magazine akin to Time or Newsweek uh, called um, Medical World. Uh, and he was the editor of that. And it had uh, some very reasonable articles in it back in the 60s. Uh, regarding marijuana, and uh, I thought that was really unusual at the time, and now I, now I see why uh, this guy actually thought. Uh, the guy who was the editor of the semi-official um, U.S. Uh, uh, military medical journal, military surgeon, was a guy named Colonel James Thalen, and in 1943 he wrote an editorial called The Marijuana Bugaboo, Bugaboo Assailing the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, he wrote almost the same editorial in the same magazine in 1954, entitled uh, The Marijuana Bugaboo Revisited. In 1944, the New York Academy of Medicine, as part of the LaGuardia Crime Commission report, recommended the legalization of uh, marijuana. And in 1947, doctors Ramsey and Davis um, did a study on institutionalized people, I think they had cerebral palsy, uh, who also had intractable seizures. And five out of the seven of them had almost no seizures or no seizures after using cannabis. And they suggested that it would be a good idea to test it on uninstitutionalized people. And let's see, uh, we started doing that this year. So that's what, 67 years or 57 years? We're right on it. We're right on that one. Okay, so it was, uh, cannabis was available in American pharmacies until 1942. It was in... Remington's textbook of pharmacy, and in 1928, the University of Minnesota, uh, you know, right down the road here, assigned uh, their pharmacy students in the School of Pharmacy to make tincture of cannabis, and they were teaching them how to make tinctures. Now, how do I know that? Well, my father was a pharmacist. He was a graduate of the University of Minnesota, and I also mentioned this to my cousin. His father was a pharmacist. He graduated from the University of Minnesota. They didn't take this course at the same time. Both of them had that uh, assignment. 
And when my father told me about the assignment to make tincture of cannabis, I think we were talking about alcohol prohibition. And he said, and we had to be very careful because the alcohol was illegal. Uh, okay, so we've already mentioned uh, the New York Academy of Medicine, mentioned my father and my uncle, very careful. 1941, at the end of 1941, uh, cannabis uh, was removed from the United States Pharmacopeia because its use had dropped. A lot of people think the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act made marijuana illegal. No, it just made it cumbersome to use. And the combination of what I call the cult of modernism and the cumbersomeness of using it because of the tax and also the additional expense, the common use of uh, cannabis as a medicine dropped sufficiently that the uh, editors of the USP uh, deleted it. I don't think there was any political chicanery that obviously had preceded it with the Marijuana Tax Act. Um, I just uh, throw that in there because uh, Nixon is, is such a bizarre political character. Uh, and Elvis, Elvis, and this is sort of triple irony, if you will, wanted to be a DEA agent. And of course, we know Elvis died from abuse of prescription drugs. So I think, what, what incredible irony. And one of the things that Nixon's uh, quoted on in the Nixon tapes is, uh, he's talking to Haldeman, he says, something like, what's wrong with these damn Jews? Uh, they, they want to legalize marijuana. I think it's because so many of them are psychiatrists. So uh, Keith talked about the Controlled Substances Act, and it made cannabis a Schedule One drug. Schedule One drug means a drug that has no known uh, therapeutic uh, use. Boy, I'm going to move on here. We're not going to get anywhere near done. Uh, it was only supposed to be in there temporarily until the commission came back in 1972. And so and that was said by Roger Egerberg, who was a physician, former dean of the USC School of Medicine and was the undersecretary of HEW. Um, and if, uh, you know, the people, the bureaucrats at HEW had been followed, it would have been rescheduled. Um, okay. So Keith pretty much covered the Nixon Marijuana Commission. So. How did we get to where we are here, or particularly in regards to the medical aspects of cannabis? And, uh, Keith covered how we got here in regards to the recreational use. Uh, so we had the Ramsey and Davis study. We had the marijuana bugaboo revisited by Colonel Phelan. Uh, the last legal hemp plant was harvested in 1957 in Wisconsin. Uh, had the Nixon Marijuana Commission. Then we get into the more modern stuff. Robert Randall uh, had glaucoma. He was going blind. Uh, he lived in Washington, D.C. Uh, his house was busted uh, when he was away, he came back, and he said, well, I'm going blind. And uh, they said, uh, prove it. And so he went to Johns Hopkins, and they said, yeah, he's going blind. And we've tried everything under the sun, and he'll go blind. Uh, and uh, so the government said, well, we need a second opinion. Uh, so uh, he went to uh, the Jewel Stein Eye Institute in Los Angeles and said, yeah, go blind. So in 1974, they gave the uh, marijuana to a researcher at Johns Hopkins, and then after a couple of years, he parlayed that into a full professorship elsewhere. And then the government started the uh, Individual New Drug Program in 1978. And eventually they had 15 people on that that the government was sending uh, medical marijuana to 300 nine tenths of a gram uh, uh, cannabis cigarettes went out once a month. Uh, one of the people got his every uh, three weeks. Um, okay, then you had the Institute of Medicine. Their first report came out in 1982, and, and it was science, and it was fairly favorable to marijuana. Um, in 1996, you had Prop 215. Again, uh, uh, Keith uh, touched on that. In 1997, you had the House of Lords, uh, the upper chamber, uh, the hereditary chamber in uh, Great Britain. They had their Science and Technology Committee do a report. Uh, I commend you to taking a look at that at Google. It's still one of the better reports out there. And they had been concerned that it appeared that there was a disproportionate number of people in uh, England arrested for possession of marijuana who had multiple sclerosis. And in 1997, GW Pharmaceuticals, who makes Sativex, that's legal in Canada since 2005, tincture, cannabis, uh, marijuana, and it's also legal in 20 countries in the world. The United States is not one of them. 
However, there was a phase three clinical study that the FDA approved that was successful and both their North American medical consultant and their uh, CEO are guardedly optimistic that uh, this will um, be approved sometime next year. In 1999, the Institute of Medicine, uh, which is an arm of the National Science Academy, uh, in a study or report that was funded by the federal government, said cannabis is not a uh, uh, gateway drug, uh, that there is no such thing as addiction to cannabis, and that cannabis has uh, medical value. So for anybody that can read, uh, you would think that that should have uh, uh, settled things. Okay, and what I mentioned about the medication uh, that was sent out by uh, the government to these 15 people, uh, and it was, the program was suspended in 1989 and eliminated in 1992, but they allowed the people that were on it to continue to stay on it. There are still four surviving patients Although, as I understand it, two of them, one who's in Iowa, uh, have had trouble getting doctors, so they may not be currently receiving uh, the medication. And this is Bob Randall, uh, who had glaucoma, uh, and they're smoking uh, one of the uh, uh, government-provided uh, cigarettes. And cannabis will lower your intraocular pressure by about 25%. In most cases, that is sufficient to save your eyesight. Now. In the uh, early 80s, there were a lot of people that had AIDS that uh, discovered that cannabis was useful uh, in treating neuropathic pain and in assisting their appetite and helping them with depression. Uh, and the government wanted to be able to continue to say that uh, cannabis had no uh, medical value. Uh, they encouraged the development of THC. They told the company you cannot extract it from the plant, even though it's a lot cheaper, uh, and they have to make it synthetically, so they did. And I'm the number one prescriber of Marinol in our uh, area, and I tell my patients this is more expensive, has more side effects, and doesn't work as well as marijuana, but you can go into your drugstore and get it. And actually, there's a few uh, insurance companies that are covering it for the off-label indications that I often uh, recommend it for. So, I mean, here you have Marinol, which has one cannabinoid, and cannabis, well, at the time I wrote this, there were, said there were 66, but there's probably somewhere between 80 and 100 cannabinoids in the plant, plus it has terpenes and all that sort of good stuff. I mean, the, the illogic and the lack of consistency on the part of the government is uh, impressive. And I mentioned that the uh, IND program entered in 1992, and the uh, reason for that uh, given by the acting Surgeon General was that uh, uh, Randall had given some uh, lots of talks and he had spoken to a group of people with AIDS in San Francisco and I've heard varying reports that they'd received 300 applications or a thousand applications and he said boy if we get this many people on it the public might get the idea that marijuana was actually good for you so they couldn't let that happen. Okay, so in 1992, we had the characterization of the endocannabinoid system. Your body makes its own marijuana. Uh, it isn't there very long and isn't there in very high concentrations, but it also has its own receptor sites, which is why cannabis works. Uh, in 1999, uh, GW Pharmaceuticals uh, started doing research as a result of the uh, House of Lords um, uh, report uh, and they uh, have, t uh, their product comes from two whole plant alcohol extracts. One of the uh, strains is high in THC and the other strain is high in CBD. Um, and then you've had uh, other studies done by, uh, uh, at the University of California, San Diego, which is where the California Cannabis Research Center is, uh, Don Abrams, uh, Mark Ware, who is up in Canada, Don Tashkin, who did the work uh, on uh, marijuana and cancer, and I'm gonna move on here. We talked about Ramsey and Davis already. In 1964, Dr. Raphael Mishun characterized the structure of Delta 9 THC. He's at Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem, and his lab is really the epicenter of uh, research on medicinal cannabis. Uh, you also have uh, lots of research going on in Italy, Spain, Germany, uh, and uh, England. There is some research going on in this country, but none of it with cannabis. It's with uh, you know, 
single molecule compounds like THC. You can't give a talk about medical cannabis without talking about the late Dr. Todd McCurria. Uh I met Todd when we were both volunteers at the Haight-Ashbury Clinic in the late 60s. He is a, was a psychiatrist. He was a target of the federal government. In 1968, he worked for the National Institute of Mental Health and handed out marijuana research grants. That didn't last very long because Todd uh, was familiar with the history. He'd read the Indian Hemp Commission report, which is eight volumes and 3,300 pages long. And he wanted to approve grants that would look at the medicinal value of cannabis. NIMH wanted him to approve grants that showed the harm. Uh, so he didn't last very long there. He was one of the co-authors of Prop 215, which, as uh, Keith uh, said, uh, was passed in California in 1996. So the endocannabinoid system uh, modulates our sensory input. It's a critical system. It's the largest neurotransmitter system in the body. It's important for homeostasis. Um, it, the things that are important are dopamine, retrograde inhibition, CB1 and CB2 receptors. And I think I'm gonna skip through the endocannabinoid system very rapidly, even though I think it's important because I wanna get on to uh, some other stuff. But it, there are two different receptors, the CB1 and the CB2. CB1 usually found in the brain, CB2 in the periphery. There are two known neurotransmitters, which are marijuana-like substances, anandamide and 2-AG, and there are enzymes that are important in metabolizing these neuroreceptors. Uh, the neuroreceptors are found uh, uh, largely in uh, the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. No um, receptor sites are found in the brainstem, which is why there has never been an overdose from marijuana. Uh, I was in Denver about a month ago, and I made a joke, and there was somebody there who came to be critical, and I said, really, the most negative thing you can say about research is, if you drop a 1,000 pounds of marijuana on the hind leg of a rat, you'll break his leg. And I guess he thought I was being serious, which I guess that is serious. If you do that, that will happen. And he was critical that there was no research. Now, as I say, there's only been 20,000 research studies. This is probably the most research uh, pharmaceutical that's out there. So if he believes that we need more search, research on cannabis, then I guess he also believes we need to shut down every drugstore in the land. Retrograde inhibition. Uh, I won't go into that in any detail, but basically this is a mechanism for slowing down the speed of neurotransmission. So you can see how that would be helpful in terms of decreasing seizures or decreasing migraines, both of which result from excessive neurostimulation. Okay, so the 483 chemicals. This was an old slide. It's got more than 66 cannabinoids. The terpenes are more important than we give them credit for. They're the thing that give the plant its odor. Uh, all citrus fruit have terpenes in it. In Ed Rosenthal's, one of his books, he says if you have low quality cannabis and you're looking to get high on it recreationally, eat a mango about an hour beforehand and it will increase the high that uh, you, uh, you have. Uh, terpenes, uh, distinctive odor in fruit. The entourage effect is really important. This is why cannabis is uh, better than Marinol, because it contains all the can cannabinoids and all the terpenes and the flavonoids, and they work together in some kind of concerted, collaborative uh, effort. Uh, and it's also probably one of the things that makes cannabis have fewer side effects than, um, than Marinol, because THC is the principal euphorian in the plant, but CBD tends to partially block the euphoria of THC, uh, as well as having no euphoria itself. And as Don Abrams, who's an oncologist at UCSF, says, uh, you know, in my patient population, a little euphoria isn't a bad thing. So machine link came up with the entourage effect and the idea that the various constituents of the plant act in concert uh, and that the effect of the whole is greater or more effective than the sum of its individual parts. We talked about the House of Lords already. This is a little bit out of order. GW Pharmaceuticals, we talked about them already. Uh, this is their product. It's an under the, the tongue spray uh, available in 20 countries in the world possibly soon in this country, which is interesting as to what will happen uh, if we legalize this in this country. They hired uh, GW uh, 
they, they came to normal, uh, one of their conferences, and they came to patients out of time, and the government told them, if you keep going to those conferences, we won't approve your drug. And he hired Andrea Barthwell, Dr. Barthwell, almost got the Republican nomination in Illinois to run against some fellow named Barack Obama, uh, uh, but uh, went to uh, uh, Alan Keyes instead, beat her out. And so she was the top doc in the drug czar's office, and she became a shill for uh, GW. Now, on full disclosure, I own some stock in GW, but uh, a minuscule amount, so I mean, nobody's gonna listen to me at GW. But anyway, they hired her, and she uh, ran around saying that uh, Sativex, which is tincture of cannabis, which is a whole plant extract, isn't marijuana. Now, ponder that for a while. So it, it has a lot of different therapeutic uses. I mean, and this is really what uh, I think I'm here to talk about is that there are these therapeutic uses. And I've been doing um, uh, clinical practice uh, that involves uh, cannabinoid medicine and also pain management. And I have seen some very, very sick people. Uh, and this is why you should be out there pushing for reform. I mean, to have somebody who has Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis, or to have somebody who has Alzheimer's and to make their family suffer even more because we can't give this person something to help them sleep and calm them down without side effects. It's criminal. It's, it's terrible. I, I used to say, uh, I, I mentioned this to a, a panel at LEAPAD, and I said, you know, we ought to go after these judges and these DAs for practicing medicine without a license. And it seems to me that you might want to go after uh, Governor Dayton for practicing medicine without a license. Okay. So this is a long list of uh, conditions that cannabis can treat. I remember in about 1976, I was looking at an issue of High Times, and it had a list this long and longer, some guys in some white lab coats. And at that time, I really hadn't taken a close look at things, and I thought, oh, these guys have got to be joking. I mean, uh, I, I was in favor of um, legalization of marijuana. I was a big fan of uh, uh, Keith Stroop's. Uh, but I didn't understand uh, the medical utility of cannabis. And then as soon as I kind of opened my eyes and started taking this stuff seriously, I realized that High Times had it absolutely correct. So there's a lot of different conditions. The number one reason for recommending cannabis is analgesia. The number one time to take cannabis is at bedtime because not only uh, do some people have insomnia for no particular reason, but uh, also anxiety and um, uh, pain can keep you awake. It's an anti-nauseant. It's very good for treating arthritis uh, because of the anti-inflammatory properties as well as the analgesia. It's useful for migraines and anxiety. And there's a, I, I've gotten to be fairly expert in terms of the use of cannabis for attention deficit disorder. Uh, of course, seizures, Sanjay Gupta uh, made it really popular for that. Uh, glaucoma we talked about. Um, a whole variety of autoimmune diseases. Uh, we've got fibromyalgia, restless leg syndrome, complex uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy uh, that it's good for. Also, a lot of uh, abdominal problems, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, useful for depression. And another thing you know, to go after your legislators is we send people over to Afghanistan and Iraq, we had sent people over to Vietnam, and they're there for one tour, two tours, three tours, and we're amazed and they come back with post-traumatic stress disorder. And cannabis is useful in addressing the issues of being hyper alert, of having easy startle, of being quick to anger, of having nightmares. So uh, you might ask your state legislators if they support our men and women who are coming back from Iraq. I got two minutes, okay, great. Mental health issues, we touched on that. Benefits to AIDS patients, uh, appetite stimulant, anti nausea, and antidepressant. Benefits to cancer patients. Now, this is really the next frontier. Uh, there's a video out called, What If Cannabis Cured Cancer? Uh, and I recommend that you take a look at that. And, and what Dr. Abrams has said is there's 
more than enough evidence to justify doing a double-blind study. Because I'm a physician, I can't stand up here and tell you that cannabis cures cancer. There's lots of lay people that can tell you it cured their cancer. And, uh, you know, they won't lose their medical license uh, for telling you that it cured their cancer. Attention deficit disorder. I've had a lot of patients who told me their grades went from C's and D's to A's and B's after using cannabis. We talked about PTSD. Uh, it, you know, talked about its usefulness, its safety. Every uh, major study that's ever been done by a country has recommended the legalization of uh, uh, cannabis for recreational use. Um, cannabis use during pregnancy, Dr. Melanie Dreyer, who's the Dean of School of Nursing at Rush Medical School uh, in Jamaica, found that children of women who smoke marijuana during pregnancy reached their developmental landmarks and did better in school than women or children who uh, haven't used marijuana at all. Dr. Donald Tashkin, who's an emeritus professor at UCLA, did a study where he compared 1,100 uh, patients with uh, uh, upper respiratory uh, cancers and uh, with a group of 1,100 people of similar age, sex, and geographic distribution and found that the more marijuana you smoke, the less likely you were to get lung cancer. No one was more surprised than he was. I, I've got the sign that I'm done, but I'm going to uh, hopefully take about five more minutes here to uh, wrap it up for you because I want to end up with a little advice to uh, the governor. Okay. In, in 2009, uh, the AMA uh, recommended that cannabis be rescheduled to Schedule 2. Again, this, there's no sense for it to be Schedule 1, uh, and this would allow some more reasonable research to be done. And uh, over 100 health organizations support the medical use of marijuana. This includes the American College of Physicians, the American Nurses Association, and the American Public Health Association. Um, I think we'll skip this. So cannabis shouldn't be included in Schedule 1. Uh, and you have the courts ducking things. Uh, Americans for Safe Access in 2013, a three-judge panel uh, affirmed the administration position, and they said there wasn't enough research. I guess 20,000 studies is not quite enough. This is a state's rights issue. Uh, in 2005, in Gonzalez versus Raich, it was a six to three decision. The three dissenting justices uh, were uh, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, Clarence Thomas, and um, Chief Justice Rehnquist. I think it was the best, maybe the only intelligent uh, a decision ever rendered by Justice Thomas. So we've got all these laws uh, out there, um, and we're in a position where there's change. Uh, Obama has said one thing and does another. Holder, as he's going out the door, says he wants to see change. This is an ideal time for you in Minnesota to make some change. I'm going to skip over the clinical standards here. Basically, my point is, is that uh, doctors, frankly, there shouldn't be cannabinoid medicine specialists such as I am. Your primary care provider should be recommending cannabis uh, rather than, than them rolling their eyes or saying, I don't know anything. Um, you know, it, we pre-screen everybody. We ask three questions. What's your diagnosis? What treatment have you gotten? And when was the last time you got treated? The most common person that we turn down is somebody who sounds like a sophomore at UCSB, which is about two miles away, who says, I can't eat and I can't sleep. When was the last time you saw a doctor? Well, I don't believe in doctors. So we don't, they don't get, um, you know, an appointment to see me. No skin off their nose. There's plenty of doctors that they can see. So the California Marijuana Research Center done 18 FDA-approved smoke marijuana studies. The reason they were able to get away with it, the state of California allocated nine million bucks and they had a report to the legislature that came out in 2011. Uh, these studies were done at four different medical schools. At least five of the studies had to do with pain, and I suggest that uh, you take a look at that. It's a well-done uh, report. The um, PTSD, uh, the government made uh, Sue Sicily, uh, University of Arizona, jump through a bunch of hoops, and finally she got approved. And when she got approved, the Arizona State Legislature was able to uh, somehow um, take the money away for her position. I guess in Arizona, they like to see our fighting men and women suffer. 
We are doing studies uh, on Epidiolex, which is a product from GW. It's a high CBD strain uh, that's uh, probably useful in uh, decreasing uh, seizures. It's being tested in about 25 places in the United States. Uh, you also have a study that's been approved for Sean McAllister uh, on taking a look at THC for breast cancer. Since CBD plays an important role, uh, I think it's great that they allowed him to do this study, but I, I think it would be a lot better if they actually used the uh, whole plant and the constituents of the plant that have been shown to have more of an effect than THC on cancer. And we know from uh, Mr. Obama's own uh, autobiography that he smoked marijuana. I can tell you uh, from a patient of mine who was a classmate of his at Occidental that he was one of the top marijuana smokers on campus. And from one of my other patients from Hawaii that he and his cousin uh, were not adverse to selling marijuana to some of their friends and colleagues. This does not make him a bad guy, nor is he a hypocrite. I mean, but it does make him more of a political realist than uh, I would have liked to see him be. Okay, so we're here to the conclusion. You've got the history. We went over the endocannabinoid system a little bit, talked a little about legality. So where do we go from here? Well, one of the things is, is that we have to insist that there be more research and that the research be done once cannabis is rescheduled to Schedule two. There's no, absolutely no reason. The other thing is we have to be very careful about the pharmaceuticalization versus individualism. Lester Greenspoon has said, don't let the drug companies steal our drug. And that's really important. And you can see that that's what Governor Dayton wants to do here. You know, okay, he wants to give it to the flower people and uh, uh, have, you know, a monopoly of uh, two uh, providers here. We need to have individual growing uh, so that we can reclaim personal responsibility for Americans. The top... The top two needs are for product standardization, and we're getting that. What's prevented that in the past is its status, its legal status. But now you can go to most dispensaries in Colorado, it may even be required there, and uh, some dispensaries in California, and it'll tell you this has 15% THC and 2% CBD, or this has 5 milligrams of THC and 5 milligrams of CBD. You actually can know what you're getting, and you need to have more professionalism. Uh, sorry, but the cannabis should be dispensed from a drugstore. If it's gonna be a drug, it should be dispensed from a drugstore. If it's gonna be recreational, be my guest, have it from a dispensary. But we're talking about something that's medical here. And my father was a pharmacist. I had three uncles that were pharmacists. Uh, one of them owned the largest drugstore in St. Paul. One of them owned Strimling Drug on Plymouth Avenue. Uh, one of them was a manager for Schneider Drug. Uh, and I'm sure that all of them, because they were practicing pharmacists in the 1920s, uh, dispensed cannabis. And I'm sure that it was no skin off their nose. Uh, my dad would talk to me about people breaking into the drugstore to steal alcohol. Nobody broke into the drugstore to steal cannabis in the 1920s. So they need to be labeled. All products need to be labeled. We need to take a closer look at dosage, and we're knowing a lot more about that. We need to look at plant constituents because it's not just CBD, it's not just THC. As I said, there are 80 to 100 cannabinoids. Terpenes also play a role in this. And GW is taking a closer look at this. And here in America, we're finally beginning to take a look at it more in Canada, uh, more in Colorado, but a little bit in California. We also don't want to have pot docs. I mean, you want your doctor to to prescribe cannabis, and if they don't, you want to be able to go to somebody who uh, is a member of the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine or something like that. By the way, I've got brochures for the AACM here. If you want to take one or uh, look at it or take a couple and show them to your doctor, uh, but they should practice by standards, and there are a couple of organizations uh, that set these standards. Dispensaries need to be professional. If we're going to have dispensaries instead of having them in pharmacies, and they can't right now because it's Schedule One, and the pharmacy should be run by either a nurse or a pharmacist. So we need to do more research on cancer and PT PTSD. We need to take a look at terpenes. Um, and this is just a reiteration of what I just said. And now my advice to Governor Dayton. Since the endocannabinoid system is the largest neurotransmitter system in the body, 
How about teaching it in medical school? You don't have to say word one about cannabis. How about teach pharmacists to make tincture of cannabis? After all, the University of Minnesota was able to do that in the 1920s. They still ought to be able to do it. How about regulating dispensaries like pharmacies? And how about recognizing that cannabis has medicinal value and that it's safe? And not just reserve it for the poor kids that have intractable seizures. How about giving it to people to see whether or not it'll deal with their cancer, or at least try to relieve their nausea? Uh, Governor Dayton is way off base scientifically by the uh, draconian limitations that have been placed on medical cannabis here in Minnesota. Now this next one is sort of self-serving because I got a call from my cousin who later ran uh, my uncle's drugstore uh, and said, uh, gee Dave, I'd like to start a dispensary here in St. Paul. And uh, later on he looked into it and found out, well no, you gotta have $20,000 uh, to throw your name in the hat and then probably some big political donor's name is going to be picked out of the hat. So I know a little bit about Minnesota, uh, even though i am uh, been in California for a long time. I was born in Minneapolis. I externed at Mount Sinai Hospital. As a child, I lived for a while in St. Paul. And I told you, uh, you know, my father and uncle graduated from the University of Minnesota. And I really commend Minnesota Normal for your efforts. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to be on uh, the uh, schedule here with uh, the wonderful people that uh, you have. I, I know uh, Diane Goldstein, and I, I, I think uh, this afternoon uh, uh, that if, if you go to her presentation, you won't be disappointed. The law enforcement uh, against prohibition people are some of the most knowledgeable and most effective folks that I've run into in terms of drug policy reform. I wish I had more time to go over this with you. Thank you very much for having me.